Real quick, before I start this chapter, I just want to make a disclaimer real quick in regards to two individuals that I just recently spoke to, Spookio and Boxer, both from Salinas. Since those two individuals are mentioned in this book, they both asked me if I could, if I could let you guys basically know that there's a lot of things in this book that are inaccurate in regards to them. I'm not going to go into every issue, but whenever you hear their name, just take it for what it's worth. It's just part of the story. But both of those individuals said there's a lot of inaccuracy, so just keep that in mind. Chapter 29, Original Gangster, August 1999. Detective Reyes strolled toward an ordinary classroom at an ordinary community college. It was early August, the school was nearly empty, and he was surrounded by rolling fields of gold. Gavilan College was nestled at the bottom of soft foothills that made up the warmer inland side of the Santa Cruz Mountains just south of Mount Madonna and Hecker Pass. The morning fog was burning off fast, but the day wasn't expected to be a scorcher. He was excited but also worried. Would a carnal of this statue want to talk? Maybe raise his presence would make the source freeze. Maybe he'd come out here for nothing. He had latched on to another mentor a gang investigator from Santa Clara County who, impressed by the Watsonville Hall, became convinced that Reyes was a serious student. The cop invited him to meet a man who was the stuff of legend, one of the earliest surviving members of the Nuestra Familia. You didn't get any more original gangster than this guy. Reyes and his colleague entered a classroom where they shook hands with a mild, wizened man who appeared older than his 56 years. Reyes understood that this was the only in-depth interview the man known as Black Bob had ever given, and it would likely be the only one he'd ever give. Reyes decided he wouldn't speak. He would just listen and learn. Most of all, he tried not to give the guy any reason to stop talking. After a bit of small talk, Black Bob dove into his life story. Way back in 1963, he said, sailed up with an MA leader in San Quentin, a man called Champ, who was a fine boxer. Laeme was moving speed and heroin in Quentin, and young Black Bob had his own little business going with relatives smuggling in heroin during visits. Champ admired that he asked Black Bob if he'd like to join Laeme. He told Reyes and his colleague that he considered the offer. His own father had been in a prison gang, and in those days, Laeme was the only choice for Latino inmates. He was aware of tension between the Northern Chicanos and Laeme, but thought he might sign up anyway. He just never got around to it. The next year, a group of Northern California inmates, plus one vato from Los Angeles, formed a group called the Familia Cinco. Their leader was known as Padre. An inner circle was appointed to send orders to a larger group of soldiers. Reyes had to make himself keep cool when Black Bob mentioned he was present while the Great Shoe War went down. So many legends circulated about the Shoe War. You never knew what to believe. Some said it took place at DVI, Dual Vocational, while others said it went down at Soledad. Black Bob set the record straight. It was most definitely in San Quentin. It wasn't San Quentin, South Block. It came after a cell search by the guards. An inmate named Mad Dog noticed that the new shoes his family had sent were missing from his cell. Soon after, Mad Dog saw some cat named Robot wearing them. When confronted, Robot said they were a gift and refused to give them back to Mad Dog. Boy just fucking hogged on his fucking kicks, man. God damn. Fucking took his shoes and wouldn't give them back. No wonder that started fucking war. The next day, the cell doors opened and the Familia Cinco and Laemi went to work. That boy wanted them kicks bad. All the way into the infirmary, the riots and fights lasted for days. In the end, the northerners lost. I don't know about that. <laughs> Whatever, Mr. Arthur. No, I don't know, man. It depends on who you ask in regards to that one. Laeme was too tough. Black Bob acknowledged. In the wake of the Great Shoe War and Familia Cinco's defeat, he said a group arose in Soledad. It called itself Nuestra Familia, or Our Family. Well, Reyes Stop. That explained why some cops said the gang started in Quentin and others said Soledad. They were both right. Black Bob was not a founder, but he was one of the original members of the newly found Nuestra Familia, and he became its leader inside San Quentin. He was proud of his new family and urged all familianos to get tattoos to show their pride all over their bodies. A mass membership drive ensued, and although the recruits were not always of the highest caliber, 
the familia's numbers swell. At that point, the early 1970s, they were still just a prison gang with a little reach on the streets when Black Bob paroled. The Veteranos' next statement came as a shock. Babo Sosa, the gang's legendary founding Nuestro General, was not Chicano. He was Puerto Rican and he was from Southern California. Reyes was dumbfounded. He'd always been told that the NF was the Chicano pride movement from the north, that they molded their precepts on those of the radical Brown Berets. Now he was hearing that some of these early soldados were from San Diego. Many were white and their founder was Puerto Rican. Reyes thought of thousands of Norteño kids fighting for the Chicano raza Mexican pride and it all seemed so absurd, more pointless than he'd already come to believe. Black Bob let that sink in, then he continued. He soon found his way back to prison, he said, and landed in Soledad with Bobo and Death Row Joe, another name Reyes recognized, this time from a federal RICO case back in the 1970s and 80s. Bobo and Death Row Joe told Black Bob to write an essay about himself and his ideas for bettering the organization. He wasn't a good writer, so he asked if he could deliver an oral report, and they said okay. His real reason was that it went against his grain to write things down. He didn't want anything on paper that could someday be used against him, whether by the cops or his gang. He didn't say, but Reyes wasn't going to interrupt to ask. Hoping to impress his prison colleagues, Black Bob delivered an oral treatise on the rampant use of drugs among NF members and said this could lead to the organization's downfall. The men loved it and soon passed a no heroin use policy to be followed by all carnales. The fact that Babo and Black Bob were also users was quietly ignored. One side effect of the new law was that it led to a drop in membership, but the leaders decided that was for the better. They wanted brains more than brawn. Let Laeme have the junkies. Then Black Bob, Babo, and a few others sat down to write the NF's first constitution. They called it the Bible. Over the next few years, procedures were refined and rules, hit lists, exams, and homework assignments were all spelled out. The NF again swelled to include hundreds of members. Its underground banks filled with proceeds from street robberies and drug sales. At one time, keeping as much as $25,000 on hand for bail and lawyers. But Black Bob noticed that no one ever hired a lawyer and mothers and girlfriends had to pay the familianos bail. He suspected that Bobo and Death Row Joe were embezzling the bank's reserves. He, of course, knew the Constitution inside out, and he decided to use it to his advantage. He began impeachment proceedings against Bobo and Death Row Joe. The move meant Bobo was put on freeze, relieved of duty until the investigation was complete. Black Bob's mutiny proved successful. The NF's inner circle concurred with his assertion that authority had been abused. Bobo and Death Row Joe were impeached. Some suspected Black Bob had done this so he could become Nuestro General, but he always denied it, and he denied it again to Reyes and his friend. To be safe, the inner circle assigned Black Bob four inmate bodyguards due to the decisive circumstances of his ascent to power. It was the early 1980s, and investigators in the Department of Corrections grew concerned that the NF was growing in strength. In a misguided attempt to divide its leaders, Black Bob was abruptly sent to Folsom Prison, where he met a couple more men whose names were familiar to Reyes. Pinky and Corny were among the current generals in Pelican Bay. Along with three others, Black Bob, Pinky, and Corny became known as the Folsom Six. Their time in Folsom was difficult, with Laeme and Aryan Brotherhood members attacking them at visits and throwing piss on them when they passed through the halls. Black Bob quickly instituted order among his ranks. He made everyone rise at 5 a.m. to do the machina exercises and the grimacing maid nicknamed him the coach. The Folsom Six pronounced widespread changes for the NF. Some of this was strategic. Membership had fallen again and they needed to shake things up. They no longer had one general. Instead, they formed a board of directors, the MESA, with representatives from different regions. They also decided that any MESA member was required to have killed for the cause. The Folsom Six were the ones who created the membership ranking system of categories 1 through 3, a system Reyes knew was still in use. They started a subsidiary gang called Nuestra Raza. The name would throw off law enforcement while its members forged the NF's first close ties to the streets where, after all, most of the income was generated. They recruited NR members anywhere they could, in the YA, in the prisons, 
and the county jails. Nuestra Raza would be a doorway into the familia and a way to push those who were less committed to put in work. The NR's hermanos would fill the regiments that were being established in every region of the Norte. The Folsom Six envisioned generations of familianos and they encouraged members to marry within the gang to ensure their babies would grow to be the soldiers. For a while, they tried their hands at legitimate business. A carnal sister cut a 45 called El Mensaje de Nuestra Familia. It never took off. Then they tried selling t-shirts at flea markets with their sombrero and bloody dagger logo that read Nuestra Raza Unida. But those weren't a big hit either. Through all this, Salinas was on the rise. Its native sons were taking over NF leadership in prisons around the state. Other soldiers felt that Salinas men only looked out for their own, but Salinas quickly became the dominant regiment for the organization, a bunch of working people, as Black Bob told the detectives. The years wore on, and by the mid-1980s, Black Bob decided to walk away from the bloody universe he helped create. He had enough of politics and infights, and he wanted to retire. He felt he'd done his share. He told Pinky and Corny he was disengaging. He paroled, got a job as a motel janitor, and was content to work, use a little heroin, and go about his business. But first, he made sure to visit the families of Pinky and Corny. It was his insurance plan. The message he delivered was that if the leaders chose to mess with him, his surviving family would be sure to pay their families another visit. Boy, was smart. The insurance policy apparently worked. By the time Black Bob wrapped up his recollections and they all said goodbye, the sun was on its way out of the sky. Reyes drove home full of questions. The idea that had been shaping itself was solidifying. Why couldn't they start their own little NF task force right here on the central coast? Get gang cops in Watsonville, Salinas, Castroville, and all the little farm towns together so they could mirror the FBI's work on a local level. He brushed the thought aside. He was fortunate his boss allowed him time to pursue this passion at all. At first, no one, himself included, believed the NF was much of a problem outside of the prisons. Now they were all beginning to see the light, but convincing anyone in their financially strained central coast towns to start a new task force was surely a losing cause. He marveled at his good fortune in being allowed to sit down with a legend like Black Bob. Hard to believe, too, that this guy was still alive. He was apparently so venerated, no one dared question his departure from the familia. Perhaps Black Bob's secret was that he stayed respectful through it all, never fingered anyone for a crime, and his successors returned for the courtesy. Here was one of the men most responsible for the spread of violence through the state, and yet Reyes, a dedicated cop, felt a certain kinship. The man had finally gotten out. It was not like Reyes' grateful departure from his own gang, though his exit was on a far less momentous scale. His high school encounter with Capone set the wheels in motion, but even after Capone threatened him, he wasn't sure of the way. He still could not envision himself as anything other than a gangster. Tony's parents decided it would be good for him to spend the summer between his sophomore and junior years with his cousins in San Jose in South San Jose. It gave him a break from the fights and pressures of hanging with the Northanios and provided a passing peek into a world outside his neighborhood and his gang. San Jose had lots of underage clubs and on summer nights, he'd go out with his cousins and lose himself in Studio 47's music. One night it hit him, wow, there's more to life than just being a cholo. There's more, he thought. He discovered that he loved to dance as the summer weeks passed, he got into the DJ stuff, mixing his own tunes, alternative sounds, club music, for his friends and cousins. He became a modern day John Travolta, tolerating the days and living for the nights. Yet, on the dance floor, he did not fully shed his gang identity. It followed him into San Jose and into the clubs, where he'd throw it out at people. He saw that being from the Salinas area made him respected. All the way in San Jose, people would say, oh shit, the Central Coast was seen as a lot of old school barrios that took care of business. The words Watson, Castro, and Salas carried weight. And when he mentioned them, people automatically took him seriously. Come fall, he returned to his fishbowl with a different outlook. He saw there was more to life than being stuck in the hood. He still respected the people he grew up with, 
and he didn't judge their lifestyle, but for the first time, he felt tugged toward a different path. Some of his friends at home had been stabbed, others arrested, a few were going to prison. When school started, he sought out new friends who were into girls, the car shows, clubbing, and music. He wanted to have fun, but healthy fun. He quit smoking weed. He hit it off with a nice girl, a junior. His senior year, however, brought him on a lot of confusion. He was about to graduate and felt excited and proud, but he had no clue what to do next. He'd always held down summer jobs, so he figured he'd start working somewhere, and yet wanted to do more, to do something productive. To accomplish that, there was no choice. From now on, he had to stay away from certain activities and certain people. Tony's North Daniel days were over. The day he graduated, his parents beamed with pride. He had survived the dangerous years, had escaped the stabbings and jail, and worse. Now, he was set out to bring that intangible positive something back to his family, his neighborhood, and his people. He had no clue where to start, but he was sure he'd find his way. And then, his girl told him she was pregnant.